Sunny Desire. Thank you, Sun Desire, for that powerful um, summary uh, of the week's lesson study. You can see that the book of John really um, wants us to be grounded, to know who Christ was. It just um, confirms here, it's, it, this lesson study goes hand in hand with what we are already reading. Uh, good morning, everyone on the platform. And I welcome you to our study of Desire of Ages, chapter 51, The Light of Life. Before we go into our lesson study, we just want to sing um, a song. Uh, <clears throat> Song number 109, 109, Marvelous Grace. When you keep studying the word of God, you see the grace, the mercy of God. Did he have to go all through this? People rejecting him, uh, people thinking he's an imposter, yet he is the creator. But he went through this. Satan was vibing him in every corner, wanting people not to know that he is the son of God, that he is the only one who can take our sins away. Without him would be a lost race. Marvelous grace of our Lord. Um, may I please ask the uh, Takli sisters to um, lead us in the song. Thank you. So good morning everyone, um, this has three verses, we'll take the first verse, anyone for the second. I can do the second. Thank you. Anyone for the third verse? 109. I'll take the third. Thank you. Marvelous grace of thy loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount I pause, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace god's grace grace that is greater than all our sin Pain and despair like the sea waves cold threaten the soul with infinite loss Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, Grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all believe. You that are longing to see his face, Will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace now to pardon and bless with you. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Let us pray. Father in, in heaven, thank you once more again this morning 
Yes, grace which is greater than all our sins points to the giant and mighty cross. Oh, Father, you were despised and rejected, afflicted for our sake. You were bruised and you were, you received all sorts of insults on that cross that day. All because you wanted to save us. They did not even esteem you. They hid their faces from you, Lord. And you were despised. Lord, this morning, as we come, we know that this grace, this mercy, the multitude of mercies, Lord, you showed us on the cross of Calvary. How much love. What more can you do for us, Lord? What you have not already done. And I think we thank you for the ministry of intercession, which you are still carrying on at the right hand of the Father. Thank you for that deep love for us, Lord. Lord, this morning as we dip deep in your word and the spirit of prophecy, we pray that the same spirit which you used your servant, Sister White, to write all these things for us, Lord. We pray that he will be the teacher this morning. He will open our hearts so that we can receive you. He will pour where there is any doubt, Lord. Quench away every form of doubt in us, Lord. Where there is any sin, Lord, page us and forgive us, Lord. Where there is any anxiety, Lord, give us that peace which you have promised, Lord. And Lord, we pray that this word is going to transform us in a mighty way, Lord, because you want our characters to be restored to the original creation where we had the mind of God. We are praying, Lord, that your will, not our own will, will be in us, Lord, to die to self every day and to surrender our lives to you and not to look at our lives more important than anything, but to look at you, the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you this morning for each and every one of us here this morning. You have a purpose with us. This is why you have called us this morning, Lord. You said, those who come to you, you by no means cast out. Therefore, as your children, we have come. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Father. Thank you for your mercies and for your grace. In Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen and amen. 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 And we continue uh, with our lesson, uh, lesson 51. A powerful um, lesson where we are learning so much in this lesson. Yesterday, just as a short recap, um, we were looking at the parents. This this lesson is based really on um, uh, the part which we are studying now. It's chapter 9 of John. John took the whole chapter to describe um, the situation of this blind man who was whose sight was restored by Jesus, how the Pharisees and the rulers and the scribes wanted to reject the miracle which they could see. They wanted to make sure that uh, the fame of Christ will not, people will not believe that the, he, is, he is the Messiah. But the people were seeing now that how can a man who is sinful do such an act? And they themselves, you know, they viled the, reviled the, the parents. Is this your son? And the parents were so scared to be excommunicated. Yes, they confirmed it's their son. But how he had received sight, they threw it back to the son to say, let him do that. And we saw that uh, bravely, the angels were standing with this man. Um, he, he stood firm to the Pharisees because they asked him again. He says, I've already told you. 
they didn't know that they were not just con uh, contesting with the unlearned person, but this person, the angels of um of God were the angels of God were also on the ground to strengthen this man who had received his sight. And he he stood firm and confessed that yes, he had been he is he he had received his sight and he had told them the story of how he had received his sight and he asked them do you also want to be his disciples and we see the pharisees claiming that they are disciples of moses they are not disciples of this man if they were disciples of moses there's no variance between moses and christ moses was a servant of of, of god moses received the law from christ moses even rejoiced when he was talking about the Messiah who is to come. So if they were true servants of Moses, true disciples of Moses, they would not have the spirit where they wanted to kill Jesus because they, the fame, he, they did not want him. They, they, they continued saying that he was an imposter. They did not want to admit that he was the son of God because he did not meet their own standards to say if the messiah comes he's going to liberate us from the romans if the messiah comes he's going to be somebody who is pompous like them or something like that they thought israel was going to be restored to a a nation which is of fame and and everything but this messiah was not what they wanted to see they wanted to get rid of him but they yet they had isaiah 53 with them who described exactly what was going to happen to the Messiah. And they did not see that they were fulfilling the prophecy which, which Isaiah had, had been shown. But they were so bent with their denial. And now, as yesterday, we saw that he, when this man confessed, he was confessing. And we also looked at how this church, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church, we are, uh, called to confess Christ. We looked at Matthew and and, um, and Luke, Matthew 10 and uh, verse 32 and 33 and Luke 12 verse, um, I think it's 35, who says, which says, whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my father. And if we deny to confess Christ, like this, this us as Seventh-day Adventists, we are supposed to be confessing Christ, we we have a mission which we which we are supposed to be carrying, but we have set aside that mission somehow. A few are, are, are going around with the mission which we are called to do. To the three angels' message, we are not confessing Christ; we are rejecting to to the world who Christ is by not making that confession and not following what Christ has asked us to do. So this morning, um, we will continue from where we left, unless if there are any comments from yesterday, after we did the study and we were pondering around this, what we had read, and you, you, you came into something which is which you'd like to share with others, please. This is your time before we continue to read. I don't see any hand. Uh, I don't see any hand so far. Therefore, we will continue our reading. We'll read the next two paragraphs, please. GA 474.2 and 474.3. It starts, the Lord Jesus knew the ordeal through which this man was passing. Any reader? Is Sister Arlene with us this morning? Yes, I am. Thank you, Sister Arlene. Yes, no problem. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes. The Lord Jesus knew the ordeal though, through which the man was passing, and he gave him grace and utterance so that he became a witness for Christ. He answered the Pharisees in words that were a cutting rebuke to his questioners. 
They claim to be the expositors of scripture, the religious guides of the nation, and yet here was one performing miracles and they were confessedly ignorant as to the source of his power and as to his characters and claims. Why herein is a marvellous thing, said the man, that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshipper of God, he doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. The man had met his inquisitors on their own ground. His reasoning was unanswerable. The Pharisees were astonished and they held their peace, spellbound before his point, before his pointed, determined words. For a few moments they were silent. Then the frowning priest and rabbis gathered about them their robes as though they feared contamination from contact with him. They shook off their dust from their feet and hurled denunciation against him. Thou was cast, thou wast altogether born in sin, and thus thou shalt teach us. And thus thou teach us, and they're excommunicating him. Have I said that right? Yes, excommunicated him. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. You see now what has happened. Huh. Honestly, um, the spiritual blindness in these Pharisees and uh, and rabbis. You can see that they were demon possessed. And I thank God for this um, blind man who whose sight was restored because the spirit of God was really speaking through him. There was no, no, there was no shadow of doubt within him. He was so clear. You could see that these words he was speaking, it was not his own words. He, had, he was receiving them from Christ himself. The spirit was speaking through him. He was teaching these um, these uh, scribes and and rulers, the rabbis, the word of God. Where, where, why, wherein is a marvelous thing? Says the man, that he know not whence he come. We we know not from whence he is, and yet he has opened my eyes. What a testimony! You are telling me that you don't know where this man has come from. But he's done this marvelous thing to me. Now we know that God heareth no sinners. He did not, if if he was not, if he was a sinner, God would not have used him to open my eyes. But if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. What a sermon. Since the world began. It was not yet that any man opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. So he, he was clearly preaching the connection between Christ and God himself. That he could not do anything if, he, if, the, if there was no connection. He could not be a sinful man. Because obviously there's no connection with sinners and God. And they were teaching this, these rabbis. You could see the spirit of God uh, was, was, was really speaking through this man. And I pray that, you know, when we are, when we are now confronted in courts, the conflict which is going to come we will not depend on our words, but to depend on God himself who is going to give us the right things to speak at that point in time so that the people may know 
even when we are witnessing, to say, Lord, how should I answer this person? May your spirit speak through me to humble ourselves so that we will be able to speak clearly to those who want to hear the, the voice of God. But if we go without that humility and submission to God, we will not be able to, to be like this blind man who was convinced this is the son of God, who the spirit used to rebuke the rabbis. Yes, I see a hand prayer retreat. I think it's uh, it's Sun Desire. Yes. Uh, good morning again, Mother. Good morning, good morning. It's powerful. It's uh, this 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 uh, paragraph uh, is so um, it, it is so fresh. It gives uh such a freshness to the to the word of God. Well, I, I think you have already said some of the things I was going to comment on that. It's something, there's something amazing when the spirit of God works on somebody. Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. You had okay. I don't know how you were much muted before. Yeah. Yeah. So I was saying there's something amazing when the spirit of God works um on somebody. <clears throat> uh, first of all, in first Corinthians, first Corinthians chapter one. Uh first Corinthians chapter one. Bear in mind, this is a beggar on the street, yeah. A man who was born blind. Um, surely uh, you would think that he has more to learn than more to say. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, if you notice from verse 18, what the Apostle Paul says, um, verse 18 and 19, it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved it is the power of God for it is written I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent where is the wise where is the scribe where is the disputer of this world hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world now, uh, yes, so maybe verse 21 there, it says, where is the uh, verse 21? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, I'll just skip to verse 25 there. He says, because of because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised had God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh glory, should glory in his presence. Amen. Amen. Verse 30 there is a good one as it says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So I'm just seeing uh, uh, this being fulfilled. Um, 
uh, what inspiration was saying there through the Apostle Paul. This man, he's, he's been given grace and he's speaking sense. And he's speaking sense in simple terms. You think that these things are so plain that anybody should understand. But on the contrary, once you have chosen the path of rebellion and disobedience, things that are common or things that you would think, uh, what's the word? Things that should be clearly understood. They are not common to people who have chosen the wrong path, to people who are acting contrary to God's will. I'll give you an example. So you would think that uh, it's the normal thing, like what the man is just, is speaking full of grace, but he's, he's speaking sense. He's saying, where have you had in all the world that somebody who was born blind can be made to see? Is it a normal thing? He's saying, so are you thinking this is not a miracle? Or what are you saying this is? He is, he is just struggling to understand why they can't get that this is not an ordinary miracle. Where have you ever heard that somebody born blind can now see? He says, if this man was uh, a sinner, he would not perform such a wonderful miracle. That is a, a, a normal conclusion to make. But the Pharisees would rather take a, a difficult route to come to that conclusion than to think that it is Christ, Son of God, who has done it. They would rather hear some weird explanations of how the thing came to be. Uh, and uh, uh, to say the, the list, uh, there was a man. There was a man, uh, he's now dead. Uh, some believe that he was uh, a Jesuit uh, uh, implant in the church. He was uh, called Samuel Bakioki. There was uh, once a presentation he did where he was uh, explaining a simple text which anybody, a child, should be able to understand. But this man was now a professor. He had gone through some very uh, prestigious universities, some of which were Roman Catholic universities. But now he was a professor at Andrews University. He was well-trusted in delivering some lectures to pastors and professors at Andrews University. Now, he wrote a book from Sabbath to Sunday. Now, he was explaining the text. You know the text we see in Revelation where John says, I was, it was on the lost day. He says, on the lost day, I was, uh, John 1 verse 10, I believe, uh, or 11, where he says, I was in the spirit on the lost day. Where John records, uh, uh, the visions that then came on the Lord's day. I was in the spirit, he says. Oh, now this is how Samuel Bakioki now explains that text. He says, no man knows the day nor the hour. John, the, I mean, the obvious conclusion to come to, Jesus himself said, the Sabbath, the, 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 the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So it is obvious to conclude that John was speaking of the Sabbath. But no, Bakioki doesn't come to that conclusion because he has some secret agenda. He says, no man knows the day nor the hour. He now starts going, quoting other scriptures all around. He says, so therefore, we cannot defin definitively conclude that uh, John was speaking of the Sabbath. Again, you, you, you just, um, so I'm thinking what I'm seeing here as listening to this conversation going, if the spirit of God is leading you, you don't have to worry too much about defending anything or fighting for anything. The truth is just simple and it's straightforward. And you advocate for that truth. But if you are going on the contrary, 
it, it is so difficult. I think that's exactly the words of uh, the wise man. He says, the path of the transgressor is hard. And you hear some people trying to make the scripture sound like something else. You have to keep fighting the scripture because the scripture will be rebuking you. It needs obvious explanation, but you have to go around. And we have heard many preachers. And you wonder, how did they even come to that conclusion? When the scripture is so clear, it is because they have refused the light of the day, the light of life. Amen. 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 Wow. Powerful comments. Uh, Sun desire there. When we refuse the light of, of God, you know, we try and look for scripture to support whatever. And you can see the wars which are going on on the platforms. Um, they would use uh, the spirit of prophecy this way. This the same statement is used to support that argument. And why? Where is the truth? Everyone can see the truth is as plain as ev everything. Then you wonder. I thought these were the learned men of the world. What on earth are they doing? You you know you you start seeing the foolishness of people, and. Um, I remember my sister was saying one day, um, you know, even the pastors who come onto the pulpit without preparation. Um, she was just saying, her friend was saying, I think these pastors, they think maybe um, we don't see that he has not prepared. You can see that there's nothing which he's speaking about. He's just uh, occupying the, the next 30 minutes or so. And people can actually see, and he doesn't realize that people can actually see that um, there is no message of, of, of whatever. You know, he's just talking nothing, really. He thinks he's, 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 uh, he's okay. He can get away with it. But people, we, we can see clearly, the spirit can can see that this this is just we are wasting people's time in 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 church um yeah <clears throat> yes sister metron please go ahead yes uh good morning thank you sister Kesia. you know <clears throat> you are very right as you are saying that uh you know sometimes we can see that uh Somebody is not um, no, prepared the word of God, which is quite very dangerous to uh, claim to be uh, working with Jesus when we are far away from him and not uh, studying the word of God. Because here the paragraph that we read says that um, the Lord Jesus knew the ordeal through which the man was passing and he gave him grace and utterance so that he became a witness for Christ. So if we don't walk with Christ, he will not give us the word to speak to his people. And um, one thing I liked about this um, statement is that uh, Jesus knew the ordeal that this man was experiencing from those, now we can say is persecutors now because they were actually persecuting this man over the truth that was so transparent and they decided to want to confuse his mind. But Jesus knowing that suffering, that torture or the persecution that this man was going through then Jesus gave him grace and utterance. This is actually encouraging to all of us to know that, um, you know, in whatever we experience, whatever we go through, could be in our own personal, personal lives. Jesus knows our ordeal, he knows what we are going through, but only if we can give ourselves to, to him that he can use us. If only we can say, here am I, 
Lord sent me. And then he takes over our ordeal. He gives us grace and he gives us what to say to the people that we meet as we go by. I find this to be very much encouraging to, to everyone that uh, might think, what, what can I do? What can I go and say to people? I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to preach, or, but I want to. But here is a statement that is so, so clear and so encouraging to anyone that uh, we don't do this alone. We do this with him. His grace is sufficient. He gives us the words to speak. And so he did to this man. Uh, you have already read the sermon that he, he gave this man that I'm not going to read again. He preached a powerful sermon through his own experience. That's his own life experience. And so that's, that's what God wants us, want, want us to go actually to, to, to tell the world about uh, our, our testimony. It, it is your testimony that is a very powerful, you know, sermon to people. You know, when you are uh, preaching a sermon, um, uh, you always you are touched that with your own personal experience. It uh, drives the meaning home to the hearers, to those that are listening, because they will also know that the Jesus that this person is speaking is indeed true. If he came through, through to this person in through this testimony they are talking about, that means to me as well, Jesus will come will come through to me. It's it's encouraging and it's um, you know you know you know helping the believers to know that what you suffered, God was able to deal with it. And maybe somebody somewhere in the congregation when we are talking. We'll be, a, we'll be also going through what you have experienced, but you are now saying, this is what Jesus has done to me. What ex That's exactly what this man was, was actually saying. And to all many who were blind there, he was not the only blind person anyway here. So it was a sermon to all other blind people who were hearing that I was blind, I was born blind, but now I see it was an encouraging sermon to somebody else there to believe that if Jesus did that to this man, surely he will do this to me as well. So I find these words very much encouraging to me with what I'm going through, that I need to sit down and wallow in my situation and, 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 and cry and say, God, why me? But I have to rise up and say, Lord Jesus, in my ordeal, I want to talk about you. And then Jesus Amen. will give us grace. you give us the utterance to say, Amen. 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 That is so true, my sister. Thank you for those uh, powerful comments. It's so true that, you know, um, Christ will give us the utterance just like he did to this blind man. Um, just wanted also to look at the second paragraph there, which we've read, that then the frowning priests and rabbis gathered about them their robes as though they feared contamination from the contact with him. They shook off the shook off the dust from their feet and and held denomination against him. Thou wast altogether born in sin and dost thou teach us? And they excommunicated him. They were so loud, you know, they think this blind man is so dirty. They don't want to even uh, be um, associated with them. And I was re listening to one of uh, Conrad Vine's um, sermons, um, shaking off the dust from their feet. This, you know, when I, I just thought, well, it's just a, a, a statement. But it's so loaded in the Jewish culture when a, when a person shakes off their dust from their feet, it means um, we have nothing to do with you. You are, and they they say that this was done normally to um, to foreigners, not amongst themselves, but they are doing this to one of them. 
just to show that, look, I don't want to have anything to do with you. You are much, much lower than me. I and please don't even attempt to to come close to me. That's what it um it entails here to shaking off the dust. To say, I don't want you. You remember Christ said to the disciples, uh, when when somebody when they were going out the seventy, he says, Those who do not want to welcome you have nothing to do with them. Shake off your shake off the dust from your feet. So these Pharisees ex went on further to excommunicate this man. They they are condemning him. You are born in sin. That mentality that is either his parents had sinned or he had sinned. That's why he is blind. They don't see the glory of God there. They don't see, even if they believe that, why did Jesus restore the sight then? They are saying he was born in sin. Your parents are sinful. Everything about them, about this man, to them was, was you know, untouchable. And now they are excommunicating him, giving themselves the power to say, you cannot come to, to the temple anymore. Yet, they're just like this man. And they are the ones who are more blind than this man. They will remain in their sins because they think that they can sin. I was alarmed when I was listening uh, to uh, what was going on in the in the social media when when there was a statement to say, you know, Seventh-day Adventists, they need to be re-educated. I said, God forbid, we don't want to be re-educated by any man. You have given us the, the, the Bible. You have given us the spirit of prophecy. You've given us the, the spirit of God to be able to study. Why is this man saying, you know, a lot of Seventh-day Adventists need, need to be re-educated? That was really coming from, from the bottomless pit, really. Um, re-educated about what? About Catholicism, that they have changed. We don't want that re-education. They, they, they think they understand better than everybody else that now they want to re-educate people. These Pharisees were saying here, you can't teach us. We know. We have searched the scripture. We are the ones who know the scripture, the scriptures. They think they know the scriptures, yet they don't have the spirit. They don't know anything. They are blind. They don't even understand. Same with our leadership at the moment. They think they know, and they want to re-educate the masses about Catholicism. The masses can read about that in 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 in. Uh, in the great controversy book, we can read about the Jesuits. We can read how how the um, they will not even change, but they want to re-educate people. So we need to be grounded, like this, like this blind man, to know who Christ is, to confess Christ, and not allow any man to re-educate us, but to be to be to be taught by the Spirit by the Holy Spirit himself, not any man. Any comments? I've uh, posted a question there, uh, Mother, uh, regarding excommunication. Are there any uh, uh, biblical grounds mm. of excommunication? Is it even uh, uh, biblical? Something that we can think about as well. Yes. Um, the question has been posted to everyone. Are they... Are there biblical grounds for excommunication?
are there any biblical grounds for excommunication? We we we've seen this in our churches. Uh, there are some. Um, I think there are some sometimes when if somebody is holding an office in the church, and uh, something comes to the public, you know something which you cannot ignore. Um, they can they they are not excommunicated as such to say you can't come to church, but they would have to step down from the post. I think. I don't know if I'm right there. They would have to come down on the post. Say a, a young lady is leading a uh, youth and she, she becomes pregnant out of wedlock. I don't think it's a good example for that young lady to continue being a youth leader. Um, because this is something which everybody can see. She's allowed to come to church, but she would have to step down as a youth leader. I do I do I don't know. Any comments, people? Sorry, excuse that's... me. Morning. Sorry, um, I jumped in. Um, no, that's okay. Go, go, go I, ahead, I, I noticed that that's one of the main things that they use to excommunicate and and, and you know, instead of them bringing this this young girl they don't know the situation of how this child got pregnant or whatever they always use that as we are going to excommunicate isn't there other things that that needs attention like as you say the the pastors some of the pastors are getting up to so many different things in the church yeah stealing um, the tithe, um, having affairs with the congregation, and no one does anything. You know, some of the the um, the elders and and all of those people know about these things, but nobody does anything. But as soon as a girl, a young girl in the church gets pregnant, no one goes to her and and find out and 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 console her because they don't know. But yet still, they excommunicate her. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Allen. Yes, we should always show compassion um, in whatever situation there is because we ourselves are also sinners. Um, we should always know that we ourselves, you know, it, it confuses me a bit because when we look at uh, John chapter 8, verse 37, I think, it says... Um, Let's just go back to it for that um, verse 37. Um, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and he that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I am, I am, I will in no wise cast out. Jesus never when we come to him, when we are sinful, when we have done ev everything, made uh, whatever, there is no sin which is greater than the grace and the forgiveness of Christ. So he doesn't um, cast us away. But in the church, mm, yes, Sister Hope, like, uh, your comments, please. Uh, thank you, Sister Casey, and good morning, all. I think here, uh, the excommun uh, the ex excommunicating, uh, uh, taking it, it's basically throwing him out of church, uh, and and the, the there is a difference whereby uh, perhaps someone is in the church, maybe they've fallen short and. And uh, they remain in the church. Maybe they, as as much as we all have seen, have fallen short of the glory. And and uh, just to um, uh, uh, nurture the person and 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 help that person. But here we are seeing that he was taken out. He was taken out of the synagogue. No one should be able to do that. 
No one. I, re I remember there was an instance whereby uh, it was a church. There was a church and uh, issues were happening in the church. And uh, 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 as church leaders, they, they got the police from outside to take this uh, wonderful person out of church. Mm. We, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that. I, it is not what Christ has shown because we know in Matthew, in Matthew, I'm sure it's Matthew 18, he says when somebody offends or someone does anything in the church, um, take an elder if they don't listen or take a witness. If they don't, then um, get the church involved. If they do not listen to the church, leave them. But you don't take them out. But you work because Christ never takes out. He gathers. It's Satan who brings in that spirit to scatter. Because that person, when you take out that person, you excommunicate this person. You don't know how many people he's already brought in the church. And then you're taking them out as well. So it's indeed, uh, uh, I don't know whether I'm answering it, but uh, the biblical grounds, I've, I've not seen them other than uh, um, we know, um, um, for instance, like Achan, Achan who went and did what he did and and went and brought problems and in the in the camp of Israel and Israel was being defeated because of one man. One man. But it's only God who can take him out. That is why God says he puts kings and he removes. No one should remove. It's God's purpose. He will do what he has to do. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Hope, for that. Is that um, clear? Um, Sister Metron uh, and then a, a son desire. Yes, I'll be very quick. Um, my cousin, my, my sister, my sister cousin here, yeah, we grew up together. We were raised together uh, with our grandmom. Um, he, she's late now. That's why I'm free to 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 speak. Um, she she got pregnant out of wedlock, and uh, I remember the church. Uh, they obviously censured her, but uh, that kind of a censure, to me, as I read today, looked like and looks like excommunicating somebody because this. People, when they excommunicated this person, they never went back to him to say, now you can come back and join the congregation in the synagogue. We, they, we, we don't see them doing that because they shook their dust from their feet. They rolled their robes, clean, clean robes. And um, they decided that you now have to get out. And they excommunicated him. We don't hear that he came back again. So in another way, the Seventh-day Adventist, that is done in a different way. Excommunication is done in a different way. But when we put somebody on censure to say, because this is what they've done, blah, 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 they don't go back to that person. I did not see any elder, any pastor, any person to come to my sister to say, let's go through this together biblically to show how you erred and to show why we have done what we have done. And so for you to be able to come back, this is how we're supposed to support you. Do you agree? Do you want to? It's a yes or it's probably somebody will say no, but always it will be a yes, definitely. Somebody would want to come back, but never anybody can back. You've got to learn it your own way, find your own way back. Totally, surely for me, I need to be corrected. That is excommunication, even if it's happening today. That is excommunication because no one comes back when you censure somebody. We see many people are being censured. We have them in our churches. How many of us go there to the person to say, look, this is where we're coming from. This is how we, we're doing it. And this is where we want you, how we want you to see. Let's look at the scripture together. That will not be excommunication. But if we don't go, we don't visit, we don't help somebody, we don't highlight where they erred, and so that they can never miss a step again, that's surely to me excommunication. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sister Matron. Yes, there is no compassion whatsoever. 
I think it's it's appropriate. Thank you for those comments too. If the person is holding a post, like if he's an elder, uh, he has to step down if it's a whatever, in the holding a post in church, but must be must be encouraged to keep coming to church. You know, we cannot, we are all sinners in that in that church. We, you know, um and and really show a a ministry, we should really, as you say, follow up and and study the word of God and ask for forgiveness together with God and whatever, you know, so that, uh, you know, there is that uh, compassion, no condemnation. Otherwise, it will be, will be no different to what we have seen here. Yes, um, Sun Desire, please go ahead. Oh yeah, uh, managed to meet. Yes, uh, thank you for all those uh, wonderful comments. Yeah, this is uh, um a serious a serious thing, you know, excommunication. Um, it, it's not a phrase that is or oh, that is used now. Uh, it, it's not very popular now, but it was very popular during the time of the reformers. Uh, during the time of the Protestant Reformation. Um, the Roman Catholic Church, they also took it from uh, the Jewish uh, tradition. And uh, you know, when Sister White is using that phrase, she, use it, uh, she uses it um, consistently. So when you think of what they were doing to this man, these religious leaders, it's just like what the popes were doing to Martin Luther. You know, after he had he nailed 95 theses on the uh, church door of Wittenberg, um, and they had uh, constantly urged him to recant uh, those statements. And when he refused, what did they do? They said, we're now excommunicating you. But what that meant was, you have no part. You are so just like you see there uh, in John chapter nine. You remember there was a statement that said they held denunciations against him. Now notice also what happens to Martin Luther. Uh, I think I shared a quotation from Good Controversy there. Um. It says the Pope had threatened Luther with excommunication if he did not recant. And the threat was now fulfilled. A new bull appeared. Now, a bull was, um, was a letter or... Um, anyway, it explains that a new bull appeared declaring the reformers final separation from the Roman Church, denouncing him as accursed of heaven and including in the same condemnation all who should receive his doctrines. The great contest has been fully, had been fully entered upon. So excommunication. So these religious leaders, uh, it was never given them of God now. Let's look at Matthew 18. <clears throat> now, I think as, as Adventists, we have different sets of disciplines. Um, I, I hear we, we did cite some of them. There is censure, uh, censure um, uh, where, uh, as you said, say somebody has uh, uh, been involved uh, in a situation and they have, uh, it's a public sin, it's come to the light of the church, maybe whether they have been holding an office or they've been a regular member, uh, they said it's a discipline, yeah. Um, we, we have to take it as a discipline, just like how parents would discipline their children. You also are told that, you know, uh, you probably won't... Uh, hold any office for the next year, you have to go through baptism again 
before he can get in office. For some, uh, maybe you can be given a duration, or maybe you just need to go through the waters of baptism again before to 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 recommit yourself again. It's a discipline, and uh, there's this fellowship. This fellowship is the highest order of discipline, where you are taking someone's member off the books. He's no longer uh, one of us. And that has to do with some gross uh, or public um, uh, uh, declaration by the individual that they do not believe what we believe as Adventists. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's sad that there's been people, uh, let's say, ministers, leadership, um, that um, in the past when, you know, there was a lot of uh, integrity uh, on the helm of the leadership, leadership this, was, this was a common thing, you know. People would come often over teaching heresies, um, like Desmond Ford was teaching ministers. Uh, he was a very educated minister teaching people that the doctrine of the sanctuary uh, was not, uh, uh, the church was wrong, uh, basically denying the spirit of prophecy, denying uh, what the Bible was saying on the issue. The church had been disfellowshipping people like Kellogg, teaching pantheism, the church had been disfellowshipping. So that is gross misconduct in terms of not adhering to the fundamental beliefs of who we are as an Adventist organization. If you come in public and say and declare yourself, I mean, this fellowship is saying you're no longer a member. But that's not to say we shut the door on you. If you want to come to church, that's up to you. But you're no longer a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So the church is not associated with you on that, on those terms. I, I hope that's making sense. Um, I wanted to read uh, Matthew 18. Um, so the issue of excommunicating now, this was serious. Yeah? Uh, I don't see anywhere in scripture, uh, maybe somebody can highlight to us, um, Maybe we'll continue to study. Uh, I wonder where the Jews got that from. Maybe we will also study from how the uh, the church in the Old Testament uh, was run as well during the time of Moses. I'll probably read along those lines and see. Um, there could be uh, some uh, some excommunication that was going on. You'd hear councils like when somebody would. Uh, worship an idol or maybe tell you his brethren or his friends to come and worship an idol, that person was to be denounced. Now that was fair ground because God was jealous of his own, of his worship. So that person was to be denounced. Now, but you see how Satan flips now. This man is the man who is confessing the truth. But he is the man who is being denounced. All oh, they, they, they held these denunciations. He is now a demon. It, it, it's like just as how Christ himself was denounced by the religious leader. So I think um, it's, it's a very serious point that uh, you see the church had come. And we also have to look at ourselves and think to ourselves. Are some of the disfellowships that we see now some of the things, the excommunications that are being done. Some excommunication might not be on paper, but uh, you could say the council culture. It's form of excommunication. Um, people are not saying they're removing. Um, so you, you could say, say these levels of excommunication. In our terms today, we can say council culture. But um, I was just saying, According to the council, we find in Matthew chapter 18, there is a ground uh, for that. And you can say definitively that 
uh, that was nowhere near what the religious leaders did to this man. In Matthew chapter 8, uh, what did we say? Matthew chapter 18, I believe it is. I'll just read two verses there. I'm cognizant of the time. He says, um, okay, so that's in verse 15. It says, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou shalt gain. Thou hast gained thy brother. So, one to one. And now, verse 16. If he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. That is, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So the person who is at variance has to be talked to. Okay? And there has to be clear, clear doctrine. You can't just talk to somebody and say, recant. Recant from what? You have to prove to the person first that they are erring from Scripture, from A, B, C, D, to the law and to the testimony. This is what the scriptures say. This is what spiritual prophecies say. This is not what you have done. Now, these Pharisees are not doing that. And which is the wrong example, wrong precedence that we see even now. A lot of ministers, they just come angry. Oh, he has said this. But where, where is he violating the scriptures and the testimony? You have to clearly point it out. This is what it's saying. And ye, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now the question we need to ask ourselves, how did the Jews treat people like Zacchaeus and Matthew? Those people probably were still going to church on Sabbath, but uh, people were just looking at them as sinners. Um, now, I think essentially what the text is just saying is, you know, the man is content where he is, let him be. If from his joint to idols, let him alone. And this is what the text is saying. Thank you so much for that detailed uh, the depth of, you know, miscommunication. Yes, uh, really learned something there this morning. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Elder Desire. I can't add or subtract to what you have said there. Really powerful, yeah. Yeah, we have come to the end of our study. We'll ask, uh, shall we ask uh, Sister Charlene, are you in a position to pray for us? Yes, sure. Let us pray. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful study, Lord, that we've got so much clarity and so much wisdom that we've gotten from the study, Lord, and help us to be compassionate, Lord, and to for these poor young ladies who've made a mistake, Lord, who who to take them in our in our, in our arms in the churches and to help them. And uh, they're not preaching heresy, they just made a mistake in their life. And they're young people. We need to be compassionate. Give us your your compassion, Lord. Help us to to look at them with compassion and help them in their their ways and their lives, Lord. Thank you for, for the wisdom that you've given us this morning, Lord, the beautiful wisdom in your word and the spirit of prophecy. What a rich richness we have in your word and the, 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 the books that you, your prophet write, Lord. There's so much we can learn from it, Lord. We can grow in spiritually. We can help others with amazing things you're teaching us, Lord, day by day. Thank you for this beautiful church family that we can all share together lord and the wonderful time that we can have together lord while it is still while we're still able to to do these zoom meetings soon it'll all be taken away from us so we need to appreciate these beautiful moments that we can sit at your feet together as a family lord and share and grow and learn thank you lord help us during this coming week lord and I'll do it this day that we will stay close to you lord whatever we do that we will not uh, lose sight of you, Lord, during our day that we will spend time with you, thinking of you, Lord. You are such a wonderful father, such an amazing friend. Thank you, Lord, for, for being with us and for your incredible love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you, Sister Charlene, for that prayer. Thank you so much. Um, and I would like to thank everybody who is coming this morning to study the Word of God together. It is indeed a blessing um, when we come together and study. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is, is will be there with us as we dip deep into these things. So therefore, stay blessed. Thank you so much. We'll see each other tomorrow, God willing. I hand over now to the Tuckley sisters for for announcements. Or uh, Elder Desire. Uh, sisters are leaving me these few mornings. Uh, please, sisters, you can make an announcement. Yes, thank you, Sister Kezia, for uh, that women, uh, uh, study. It's an as a deep study, and um, uh, the idea of community um, de fellowship is to get people back to, to work with them, to get them back into the faith, not to not to leave them stranded. Stranded. Um. Yes, at 12 o'clock it will be midday prayer. We've got Sister Juliet Buckner. She's um, going to be the speaker for the 12 o'clock. Um, she's, she's the uh, sister that had long COVID. I mean, she was, um, she was they, they put her in a coma. They, they said for two weeks, but it ended up to be five months. And when she came out of the coma, she had to learn everything again. And she'll probably give updating us on her um, progress. progress. Uh, she's making progress. and um, She's doing well. Yes, yeah, she's doing well. So that's 12 o'clock. Uh, 6.30 it will be song service. I don't know who the speaker is for the week yet. So, and don't forget, all the roads lead to Kevin Lee, the 25th, 23rd to the 29th of December for our winter retreat. So have a nice day, everyone. See you all later, by God's grace. Have a good day, everyone.